Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have together to study your word and have fellowship with one another. We, we ask that you, Father, open our hearts and minds to the truth that you have for us in your word and that your spirit lead us as we go through Genesis and also 1 Samuel. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. All righty. We're on Genesis chapter 3. I love Genesis chapter 3. Now, it's, it's, you know, that doesn't sound right because some bad things happen here, but they tell us a lot. We learn a lot of things in this chapter. Now, a couple things I wanted to show you here. There's a cylinder that was found, a Babylonian cylinder, that dates approximately 2200 B.C. So it would have been just shortly after the flood, actually. And it, very interesting here, and it's in the British Museum. Uh, it shows a woman and a man, and they try and describe this, what they try and say this is. Well, they're worshiping a god of, uh, of, of some kind, and that's not true. Uh, there's no depiction of ancient pagan idolatry that shows people sitting when they're worshiping their god. This is actually a man and a woman sitting here, and they're sitting with a tree in between them. And the tree, it has seven branches, kind of like a menorah. And there's two pieces of fruit hanging down. Uh, they're both reaching for it, by the way. And there is a serpent behind the woman. Right here, it shows them behind the man too, but it's a cylinder, keep that in mind. It's basically behind the woman. And it's a picture of what we're gonna see in this chapter. Uh, it's an ancient Babylonian cylinder that shows exactly what we're going to do, what we're going to see here. Uh, we have the tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is why there's two fruits on there, and the, uh, uh, them reaching for it, and with the serpent behind them, they know exactly about the fall of man. The ancient Babylonians did. <clears throat> um, there's another one, too, that's very uh, very. Interesting also, this came from the University uh, Museum of Pennsylvania. It's discovered a seal near the bottom of the Tape Gara Mound, 12 miles from Nineveh. It's about 3500 BC, right uh, shortly after the time of the flood again. And the seal shows a man and a woman naked and cowering in fear with a serpent behind them. And they're looking down, all three, they're all looking down, uh, and that would be looking at the curse of the ground which is uh, very, very interesting. And they're, they're unclothed, by the way, naked as it would appear. <clears throat> Just some ancient artifacts that have been found that it, the, the, the scriptural facts were known throughout the world at one time. That's just the way it, the way it is. <clears throat> and there's an abundance of evidence for that. This is just a couple of things here that show the fall of man is, was known uh, in Nineveh and Babylon. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has Elohim said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Well, okay. Now, I... You know, there's always a philosophical question that's asked. How could a holy and loving Elohim or God who created such a wonderful world allow evil and corruption to appear at all? How could he do that? How could he let that happen? And I've heard a lot of people try and answer that, and I think the answer is really very simple. It's all of his plan. It's all in his plan. It's the way he planned it. Um, you know, what do we know about the serpent here? A lot of people quick to say the serpent there is uh, Satan himself. But, you know, the book of Genesis never says that. We don't find out that Satan is in the serpent until Revelation. The book of Revelation tells, tells us that. And that's the only time it's, it's stated. And that's in Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, who was called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, um, the passage says that the, the 
serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. The, he, the Hebrew word is Aram. It means prudent also and sensible. He is a crafty beast. And uh, the, uh, the theory that a lot of people have, Christianity espouses it, that Satan is a fallen angel. Okay, and essentially it states that sometime between the seventh day of creation and Genesis 3 verse 1, that Satan screwed up. Okay, the theory goes like this. Satan was created perfect, and he was filled with pride due to his beauty and brightness, and he was cast down to the earth. There is not one scripture to base that silly claim on. Not one. They point to Isaiah 14, which clearly states, it's talking about the king of Babylon. We went over that just a few weeks ago. Uh, and then other people point to Ezekiel 28 also, which clearly states, it's speaking about the king of Tyre. We went over that. It's not talking about Satan. It's not, you know, the, the theory is that he was guarding the throne of Elohim. I don't know what he's guarding it against. But he's guard, guarding the throne of Elohim. And Elohim is going over here to look over the cloud to, to see... Uh, to see what John's up to. And then he sees that, shakes his head, and he looks at the throne, and Satan's trying to take over. Okay? Um, and he gets thrown out of heaven because he's prideful. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's unscriptural. It's ridiculous. You know, Satan is what he was created to be. That's what he is. Scripture says also, and this is upsetting to some, that Elohim created evil. If he didn't create it, where'd it come from? Isaiah 45, verse 7 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Yahweh, do all these things. It's all part of his plan. It's all part of his plan. You know, Yeshua said, you know, <laughs> his ways are woo way above us, as far as the heavens are above the earth, above our ways. All right? Well, I, I just don't understand why a loving God would make evil in the world. <laughs> okay, well, the only way to fix that is for you to make your own world, um, create it, make it better. You can rule it better. You can do a much better job, I'm sure. So have at it. Uh, but he's got a plan here. We read in Proverbs 16, verse 4, Yahweh has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Ooh, he created some people to be wicked? Is that what that says? That's what it says. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another popular question here is when did the first sin actually occur? Well, wouldn't you think that to tempt Eve and to question the word of Elohim was, was considered sin? So what about Satan and that serpent? Isn't that the first one to commit a sin there? Then Eve... When she's questioned by the serpent, she adds to and takes away from the word of the Father and talking back. What you got? That's it. Yeah. That's the first sin. Couldn't that be the first sin? Wouldn't you think? Well, you know, uh, yeah, because she said we're not even allowed to touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, he doesn't say you can't touch it. She says you can't, though. She said he said that. You know, why wasn't there death involved then, right away, when she did that? Well... We'll discuss it as we proceed here through this chapter, and we'll find out why. In this first verse of chapter 3, we see Satan, he's using the same lies there that he uses today. He says to Eve, you sure that's what Elohim said? You sure that's what he said? You sure that's what his word said? Um, did Elohim really say that? You know, that type of thing. He's trying to get Eve to doubt Elohim's word and to doubt Elohim's love for them. Because allegedly, because he said, uh, didn't, didn't Elohim say you should not eat from any tree of the garden? So he's trying to muffle the, uh, trying to confuse the, situ the situation here right off the bat. You know, um, he's trying to imply here that Elohim is not as good and as loving as they may have thought, what he's saying is, you know, he's holding back from you something here. He's withholding something from you. That's what he's doing. Would a loving God really do that? Hmm. You know, those two lies of doubting Elohim's word and doubting Elohim's love 
are rampant today, and they always have been. Those same, those same lies have been perpetuated since well, the beginning. The majority of people doubt the truth of Elohim's word. You know why? Because they don't believe that a loving God would allow the pain, the sorrow, and the death that they see all around them. That's where atheism comes from on an individual basis. Uh, a lot of atheists would say, well, my mother died at birth or died when I was young, and a loving God wouldn't allow that. Uh, and granted, there are some things we can't explain. Very difficult. Uh, that doesn't mean that Elohim doesn't love us and that his word isn't true. But a lot of people say that with the pretense that, well, you know what? If I were God, I'd do it a lot better. But they're not, and that's a joke. Let's continue here. Let's go on to verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. So Eve, Eve, she's trying to defend Elohim here. This accusation against he doesn't have a loving nature by saying we couldn't eat from the trees of the garden. No, he said we could. Verse 3, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim said you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Well, Eve's reaction to the serpent's question was interesting. She both added to and subtracted from what Elohim said. Um... She said, uh, you can, we can freely eat of any tree of the garden, but he didn't say anything about touching the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It appears Eve is questioning Elohim's word and Elohim's love for them. Hmm? By changing what he said. She's, uh, she said, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim said, you shall not eat from it nor touch it lest you die. Now why she had to add to it, I don't know. Just to give it more emphasis on her part. <clears throat> Verses 4 and 5, And the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die. For Elohim knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. Having first led Eve to question Elohim's authority and goodness and to twist Elohim's word, Satan kind of sets in for the kill here. Satan told Eve that Elohim's warning was only because Elohim is concerned that you would learn too much. Satan wasn't content with merely altering Elohim's word, but he's calling, he's calling Elohim a liar here. He says, you'll be like Elohim. Now that's a, that's a tough temptation for Eve. But whenever we start questioning his word, we're kind of setting ourselves up to be gods ourselves. Um, regardless of how this account is viewed by individuals, a lot of people doubt that this, this really happened. The, the writers of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, they put their seal of authority on it. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul writes this, but I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, verse 14, And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. And John writes in chapter 8, verse 44, Yeshua says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she, also, she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So now her attention's turned to this forbidden fruit here. She's not concentrating on Elohim's instructions. She's been distracted here with uh, Satan's temptations. She is enticed by, what's very interesting here, the way this is, uh, this is worded compared to 1 John 2, 16. She is enticed by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. 
And this is what John writes in 1 John 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And that comes right from Genesis 3. He's talking about the original sin here. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the eyes, and that it was a delight to the eye, or excuse me, lust of the flesh, that it was a delight to the eyes, this lust of the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, the boastful pride of life. <clears throat> um, why did Adam eat the fruit? She was deceived, but he was right there too. Why did he do it? You know, hmm? she didn't die. That could be. That's a good thought. Well, he said that day, but the day you eat of it, you'll die. Yeah, she wasn't dead. That's a good point. That's a good point. Some people say, well, I'd feel sorry for his wife and she didn't want her to suffer the penalty by herself. Well, let's, let's don't give nobility, <laughs> the, the nobility to that type of thing, because that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, he sinned just as Eve did, and was just as guilty. But, you know, when they talk about bringing sin into the world, they, they blame Adam. In uh, Romans 5, verse 12, we read, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the Torah, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no Torah. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Then if you skip on down to verse 17, we read Paul writing this, For if by the transgression of, of one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Yeshua Messiah. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. <clears throat> uh, why is a man... Blame for that. Yeah. He's responsible for his wife and his family. That's correct. <laughs> he is. Um, that, and we can read about that in Ephesians 5 and 6. I mean, we're not going to go there. But uh, Eve struggled with temptation, tried to battle it with Elohim's word. However, she ended up both adding to his word and, and subtracting from it. Uh, Yeshua Messiah, remember he was in the wilderness and he battled Satan with temptations there. And he just used the word of Elohim to uh, confront Satan with. And as a matter of fact, all four times with the temptations, he just quoted Deuteronomy, which is uh, very interesting. <clears throat> Yeshua shows us that his word is our defense against sin and Satan, and that's why we should study it and read it on a continual basis. Okay, going back to the passage, it says that uh, the, uh, the tree is desirable for making one wise. It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> Even Adam ate of it, and they both were aware then that they were naked. Now, being naked in Scripture, it's used as, an, uh, as a, a metaphor for being caught in a sinful state. In um, Isaiah 47, the first three verses, we read, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, remove your veil, strip off the skirt, uncover the leg, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered, your shame also will be exposed. I will take vengeance and will not spare a man. Lamentations 1 verse 8 says, Jerusalem sinned greatly. Therefore she's become an unclean thing. All who honored her despise her because they've seen her nakedness. Even she herself groans and turns away. Well... With this being the case, and, I, and I'm, uh, I don't know of anybody else that sees that 
this way, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil was apparently the Torah, the Torah itself. Um, when Adam and Eve ate of it, what did they see? They saw that they're sinful. Okay? A lot of people like to say, well, Adam and Eve fell from grace, they were perfect, and sin then sinned. Well, how do you sin if you're perfect? I don't think they ever were perfect. They were just created in an innocent state. Okay? That's, that's my opinion, and it, it fits Scripture. It, it never says that Adam and Eve were perfect. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that without sin. It never says that. <clears throat> um, Paul seems to be describing this for us also in the letter to Romans. It does help explain what we just read in Romans 5, verses 12 through 14. Paul tells us when the Torah came, sin became alive. Uh, follow, uh, for it says here, look, we'll look at Romans 5, 12 through 14 again. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no Torah. So Adam and Eve weren't perfect, just sin was not imputed on them because there was no Torah. The uh, term there, nevertheless, also could be indeed death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Uh, Paul says that when Torah, became alive, when Torah came, sin became alive and he died. That's in Romans 7, starting at verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, from speaking to those who know the Torah, that the Torah has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? That's a pretty powerful statement right there anyway. Okay? The Torah has jurisdiction over all of us as long as we live. For, and then he goes into a drash here, a metaphor. He says, For the married woman is bound by Torah to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the Torah concerning the husband. So then, if, while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the Torah, so that she's not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the Torah through the body of Messiah, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for Elohim. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were by the Torah, the term aroused is not in there, it's added, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the Torah, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is, is the Torah sin? Well, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the Torah. For I would not have known about coveting if Torah had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the Torah, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the Torah, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. That's the death that's spoken of by the Father. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me, for sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. <clears throat> uh, Paul goes on to tell us the Torah is holy and good and asks the question, how can something that's holy and good cause death in me? Well, it's because of sin. He continues in verse 12, so then the Torah is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. See, the problem's not with the Torah. The problem's with our sin. That's the problem. That was a problem with Adam and Eve also. See, it's not so much that Adam and Eve were without sin, so much is that sin was dead at that time. But Torah gave sin life, and then Adam and Eve died. This also explains by uh, what Elohim meant when he said they would die the very day they ate of the fruit. 
That's in Genesis 2, just last week, verses 16 and 17. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Free, uh, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Sin became alive, and they died. <clears throat> and they could no longer have the fellowship with the Father that they had at one time. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. See, because of their disobedience, they knew of their nakedness. Since we see the tr uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil as the Torah, then the term, the eyes of both of them were opened, is appropriate. Torah opens the eyes of man to good and evil. Scripture often equates knowledge with the Torah, by the way. In Hosea 4, verse 6, we read, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the Torah of your Elohim, I also will forget your children. <clears throat> Paul tells us in the Tor that Torah is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. That's in Romans 2, verse 20, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the Torah the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. He says, from the Torah we receive knowledge of sin. Romans 3, verse 20, because by the works of the Torah, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the Torah comes knowledge of sin, or knowledge of good and evil. That's exactly what Adam and Eve received knowledge of their sin, and they saw it right away. They tried to make coverings for themselves. But you know what? Nothing that man can fashion can cover our sins. Yeah. Why didn't you do that before she did out of the first? Why didn't? Before she ate from it, why didn't she see that she was naked and she knew she was She probably wanted him to join her. That's a good question, but she didn't. You know, once again, she wasn't perfect. So, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. What's that, Daniel? Yeah, I didn't want to be naked by herself, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, what was that, David? Misery loves company, right? That's, that's what it says, yes. Could be. Right. It's implied there. It's, it's trying to reason it out, I understand. Could be. Uh, yeah. Um, Of course, if you, the way you read this, too, it says she took from its fruit and ate. She gave to her husband with her, and he ate. It, it, it implies to me that they ate at the same time. She just gave it to him. Okay. We're on eight, aren't we? Yes, verse eight. And they heard the sound of... Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden. So Adam and Eve, they're now afraid of Elohim. This was new to them. They feared the one whom they used to walk through the garden with. 
This is another indication, by the way, that they knew the Torah because what's the beginning of knowledge? Fear of the Father. That's it. Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. <clears throat> Verses 9 through 11, then Yahweh Elohim called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? You know, Adam and Eve originally were to uh, enjoy fellowship with Elohim. Instead, they ran and hid from him. The very fact that they were ashamed of what they had done showed that redemption was possible. Now, it's uh, interesting, the shame of nudity here. That's not an artificial inhibition that people say today was brought about by white male dominated, dominated civilizations. No, that's not the case. The shame from nudity is an awareness of our sin. That's what it really is. It's only discarded when our conscience is hardened and it loses all sensitivity to sin. That's what happens. You know, if you're going to go into sin, um, you can try it. And lo and behold, that didn't hurt too bad. So you just take another step deeper. Then just take another step deeper. Um, it, you know, that's what society's been doing. It's what we've been doing for a long time now. <clears throat> um, I mean, we've gone into so many perversions now. We've normalized homosexuality. But now we're so far beyond that. <clears throat> well, it's interesting. The armies in heaven are clothed, clothed, by the way, in fine linen, white and clean. We re read that in Revelation 19, verses 13 and 14. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of Elohim. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. The clothing of fine linen, clean and white, that's their righteous acts, by the way. To be naked, uh, in a, metaphorically, is to be seen in sin. To be seen as clothed in white is to be seen as being righteous. Was Elohim asking Adam what happened here for in, uh, informational purposes? You know, where are you? <laughs> uh, who told you you were naked? Did he know the answers to these things? Yes, he did. You know what he's given him a chance to, to do? Is confess. Confess and ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> Verse 12 of Genesis 3. And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave it to me from the tree, and I ate. Adam didn't only beg for forgiveness, but he blamed Elohim. He said, hey, it's that woman that you gave me. That was the problem. Uh, <laughs> that didn't really work out too good for him. <clears throat> Instead of praising Elohim for his goodness, he blamed Elohim for his troubles. Well, Adam, Adam was acting foolish and immature. And it's for, for this, when I read this account, I raised four kids. Uh, I'm almost positive Adam and Eve were children of some age. They weren't adults. Okay, One, they hadn't had children yet. Okay, but the other thing is, when the kids do something wrong, and you go in the living room, what happened? What's the first thing they do? No, that's second. Second thing to do. First thing they do is run and hide. Uh-huh. Don't they? Run and hide, just like Adam and Eve did. Same thing. And then they blame each other. Okay? This, this is children. All right? I, I don't know what age. I'm not going to speculate too much. But we're not talking adults of any kind of mature age here. This is, this is childish um, by definition. All right? I'm not blaming them for it. That's just... <laughs> That's just their, their children. <clears throat> you know, and, and also that adds to what we were saying before. They weren't sinful or, or perfect, I mean, but they were innocent. They were innocent, but they removed their own innocence. 
And boy, you go off on a rabbit trail today saying, look how we're trying to take the innocence away from our children at young ages today. Oh my gosh, what a horrible thing. <clears throat> Verse 13. Then Yahweh Elohim said to the woman, what is, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Well, Eve responded, just like Adam did. She's trying to blame the serpent. No sign of repentance in either one of these two. Um, you know, they are sorry they got caught. All right? All children are sorry when they get caught. And they dreaded the consequences. Okay, the dread was there. But they weren't repenting. They were only hiding like children and blaming one another. Verse 14, And Yahweh Elohim said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. There's some questions people have had about this account. Why was Elohim punishing this serpent that Satan had used? Poor little snake. Not really his fault. Satan did it, right? You know, what? I think he did this as a perpetual reminder to man as being the instrument of his fall and of the final destruction of Satan himself. What was the snake like before this? Well, we don't really know. Um, it would, from what's described in Genesis 3, would appear the serpent has legs of some kind. He may have been in some kind of upright posture. May have been looking Eve right in the eyes when he was talking to her. Well, this curse seems to have changed all that for the poor serpent. And it made him more cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. Is there anything that can make somebody run into a tree like a snake can? Yeah, well, yeah, but a tiger, you don't almost step on a tiger. When you almost, oh, spider, no, spiders don't bring step on a spider. But snakes, you know, it's a snake, boom, run right into a tree. You, uh. <clears throat> Verse 15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. While the curse was outwardly directed toward the serpent, its main sting is against the evil spirit controlling its body and speech. The woman had already shown her willingness to follow Satan, and she showed her control over the man. Okay, you see the chain here? Satan says, I can control the woman here, and she can control him. <clears throat> well, interesting. Even though he wasn't even deceived, and she got him to do it. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 14, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being quite deceived, fell into transgression. Now, here's what Elohim did. He countered this. He put enmity between the serpent and the woman, meaning she's not going to be your ally, okay? She, she's not going to be your ally. Also, she's not going to rule over her husband. In the next verse, to the woman I said, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Also, childbirth won't come easy and rapid. Elohim says in this verse that there will come one who does not come from the seed of man with whom you'll not have dominion over. Though Satan will succeed in injuring him, he will completely crush you and all your evil ambitions, the seed of the woman. Not the seed of man, the seed of woman. Yeshua Messiah will crush Satan. <clears throat> So, that was, the, that was the key. He'll put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between Satan and the woman. And her seed will bruise his head. And reading verse 16 again, to the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Human reproduction, which... Uh, was originally given as Elohim's joyful purpose for women, is, is going to be now marked with a unique 
suffering, which serves as a perpetual reminder for our sins. Children will be the source of sorrow for mothers, while they're also a source of the greatest joys. There's no doubt about that. They're also a source of the greatest sorrows. In John 16, verse 21, whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for joy that a child has been born into the world. Elohim also said she'll have lots of them. He says, I'll greatly, I'll greatly multiply your conception. Your desire is for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now that sin is imputed in the world, Elohim gave woman a subjective disposition toward her husband. Now, we've seen that often principle denied, but it outlines the only successful method of human proliferation, which is the family. The family with the father at the head as provider and protector and the mother as the caregiver and nurturer. Now we try to switch those roles around and occasionally that might work, but not as a, not as a rule, it won't. <clears throat> Though she has a desire to rule over her husband, he is to rule over her. You know, we've seen families where wives control the family. Uh, they control their husbands. Well, it should not be that way in a family. And the fact is, and <laughs> Scripture says it, women are more easily deceived than men. And I can give an excellent example. Men deceived women uh, just a few decades ago when it became socially acceptable for a woman to live with a man. Now the man receives the benefits of sex, house cleaning, security, having his house made into a home. And what does she get? Place to live? Well, she already had that. And this was looked at as a big celebration now. <clears throat> The guys won on that. Now, I wasn't on that side, never was. But I remember back in the 70s when feminism grew big. Um, yeah, we need to get women out in the workforce, don't stay in the home. And um, yeah, I'm all, I, I talk to guys, yeah, the, we're all for it, all for it. And I'd say, I know what you're up to. You just want to get more sex. And they said, you're darn right. That's what it was all about. Yep, we want women to look at sex the same way we do. That was the plan. And they fell for it. Now men could walk away from these relationships scot-free. And it's celebrated that this is a situation now. Verse 17 of Genesis 3. Then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Adam was to be the leader to Eve, but he listened to and obeyed his wife. The next time in Scripture we see a man obeying his wife instead of Elohim was who? Anybody remember? There was uh, another example where a, uh, a husband listened to his wife instead of Elohim. Remember Abraham? Yeah, it was Abraham. He obeyed Sarah in that he take your take my handmaid for a wife, she said. And he said, Huh, okay. And have that promised son from her. Genesis sixteen verse two says, So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, Yahweh has pre prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my handmaid into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife. Um, now this thing with Abraham eventually led to what we know today to be Islam. <clears throat> and it's not that men shouldn't listen to their wife. Sure they should, but not above the word of the Father. That's the key thing here. All of your, your wife is your is your partner, absolutely. But because of these men obeying their wives instead of Elohim, we see the fall of mankind, 
and the beginning, uh, what is going to lead to the uh, fall of Israel. <clears throat> and this, the uh, prom, uh, profligation of, uh, of Islam. Verses 18 and 19, but thorns and thistles that shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field, but or by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Adam caught the brunt of the curse. This included all men and women who descend from Adam, the woman who was of him, and his dominion, which is all of creation. Man's entire life now consists of struggle against his environment, which will eventually result in his death. Uh, thorns and thistles. Were there thorns and thistles originally? Maybe not. Um, it seems more likely thorns and thistles, as well as claws and fangs in some animals, were a degenerative result of Elohim removing his sustaining presence from the earth. These things were probably due to genetic mutations, which would now exist and thrive in a sinful world. Parasites and viruses may have developed in a similar fashion also. Um, why was Elohim so, so harsh here in his punishment to inflict death on all men? Uh, actually, this is for our own good. It was better that suffering and death accompany sin rather than rebellion be permitted to thrive in a perpetual state. You know, without death, man would multiply in number and wickedness without limit. And without death, too, and, and now with, uh, with the second law of thermodynamics, we're all deteriorating. And me being 63 now, I'll tell you, I don't want to live forever like this because I'm getting worse. I mean, do we want to be just a blob on the floor and still be alive? The cigars keep, you, keep me alive. <laughs> beer and cigars are my helper. Even without beer and cigars, with or without, we're all going to die. And we're all deteriorating. Now, I felt rejuvenated when I had two hip replacements. <laughs> That's temporary. <laughs> Even those new shock absorbers, absorbers are going to wear out. It's, uh, it's a problem. You know, and the biggest problem is a holy and righteous Elohim can't be in communion and fellowship with sin. Earth will now grow old like a garment. We read in Hebrews 1, starting at verse 10, And you, O Yahweh, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all will become old as a garment. And as a mantle, you will roll them up as a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. <clears throat> you know, this, this struggle with death and decay, it's so universal that over 100 years ago, they found a law in physics they named the second law of thermodynamics. And it says that all things left to themselves become degraded and disorder, disordered. <clears throat> um, the second law of thermodynamics always had been present, but the degenerative and decaying effects of it will now affect all of creation. And the second law of thermodynamics is everything wears out. Everything wears out. Energy, after being used, converts into a lower form of energy. Now, if I've heard people deny this, but they really don't know what they're saying. Because if you, if you can deny the second law of thermodynamics, you have invented what's called perpetual motion, which we know doesn't exist. Even our little ones. They seem like what my, my parents used to call us kids, perpetual motion. Well, we weren't. Eventually that wears out. <clears throat> Things are no longer being made as they were in the creation week. They're now being unmade. They're becoming disorganized and simple. Now this curse that we're talking about, the curse of the ground and the curse on all man, that's been lifted for us by Messiah. He became the curse for us. In Galatians 3, verse 13, we read, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The curse 
of, uh, on us is fourfold. Number one is sorrow. In sorrow, you will eat of it all the days of your life. We read in Isaiah 53, verse 3, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. The curse on us is for pain and suffering. In Genesis 3.18, it says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you. In Mark 15, verse 17, we read, And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, and put it on his head. The curse on us is fourfold, uh, the third one being sweat. We read that, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Messiah sweat droplets of blood in order to bear our curse. In Luke 22, verse 44, <clears throat> excuse me, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And then physical death. Physical death. We're told, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Elohim brought his son into the dust of death in Psalm 22, verse 15, which that whole psalm is about the crucifixion of Messiah. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death. Yeshua Messiah bore our curse entirely upon himself. Not just part of it, but each portion of our curse was laid on him for our salvation. Genesis 3, verse 20. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, um, this first of all, we, we know this is Adam and Eve are two real people, by the way. If she is the mother of all living, there, weren't, there wasn't just a big race created, okay? There weren't like a, a billion people created and they multiplied from there. No, there was just Adam and Eve and she's the mother of all. And Eve was not really her name. Her name is Hava. Okay, but they changed her name to Eve. Why is that? Of course, just English translations did, but... Yeah, she's a fertility goddess. And a lot of names are changed to pagan gods in Scripture. I don't know why. Yeah. What's her real name again? Hava. It would be H A. V A H or C H A V A H A H. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's just how you pronounce it. <clears throat> it's a Hebrew, Hebrew name. Does it show in the Strongs? It should. It does. And Adam was Adam? Or? Yeah, Adam was Adam. Uh huh. Genesis 3, verse 21, And Yahweh Elohim made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. You know, I don't know how he provided garments of skin other than to uh, have to kill an animal. Let's say, say he took a couple of lambs and slaughtered them and used their skin. Uh, that, why, why were uh, we to do offerings? Why were offerings to be done to Elohim sacrifices? Hebrews tells us, the book of Hebrews says it's to show us the awfulness of our sins. And I think that's what Elohim is doing here, is showing Adam and Eve the awfulness of what they had just done. Verses 22 and 23, Then Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim sent him out from the garden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So they would not be allowed to access the tree of life. Okay. What is or what was the tree of life? Many think it's Messiah by definition. That could be the case since he was the Torah made flesh and eating or consuming his word as with the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not uncommon in scripture. In uh, Ezekiel 3, starting at verse 1, we read, Then he came to me, okay, he, then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll, 
And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I'm giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Uh, John also in Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10, John writes, And I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Uh, Jeremiah tells us that accepting the word of Elohim by faithfulness is eating it. In Jeremiah 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I've been called by your name, O Yahweh Elohim of hosts. You know, with these things being the case, the tree of life, in my opinion, is probably in his word in some way. In all likelihood, the tree of life is the book of life. You remember the book of life in Revelation is the title deed to the land of Israel and it shows the names of those who would inherit it? Adam and Eve would not be privy to who would be in the kingdom of heaven. No one was worthy of such information. In Revelation 5, the first five verses we read, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome who so has to open the book and its seven seals. So that's just my opinion. I think that's what that, the tree of life is. <clears throat> I think it's that uh, book of life. In verse 24, So we drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he questioned the cherubim and the flaming sword, or excuse me, stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, a cherubim, that's a creation of Elohim, and it's an interesting creature. Of the, it's a very high order of creation. We don't know a lot about them, we're giving some very interesting descriptions. We're not going to go to them, but because they're kind of long. In Ezekiel chapter 1, almost the whole chapter. Ezekiel chapter 10, and almost the whole chapter. And then Revelation 4, verses 6 through 8. That describes these cherubim. They have six wings, six arms. Uh, they're interesting. So, they're, dri they're driven out of the Garden of Eden. Now, it's possible that Elohim kept meeting with Adam and his descendants at certain times if they expressed a desire to know him. Um, and as we're going to find out, some did, some didn't. 